So our final speaker has the difficult job of wrapping up the conversations that we've had today on security, on digitization, and on sustainability. So tasked with that difficult job, um, I'd very much like to welcome Mr. Matti Antonen, who is Permanent State Secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland, to give those closing remarks for today's Ireland and the Nordic Baltic Eight Conference, working together for that secure, sustainable and digital Europe. Please welcome Matti Antonen. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's, thank you very much for for the Institute and uh, Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade and, and all the Nordic Baltic embassies here for organizing this. I think this has been a very topical and rich discussion on many things which are important for us. Uh, I start with the Nordic region. Uh, for Finland, cooperation, Nordic cooperation has been uh, one of the key uh, factors in our history since the Second World War, there are kind of achievements which have been very crucial for us. Already in 1950s, we created a common Nordic labor market. My family moved to Sweden from northern Finland in the early 60s, and I worked myself in Copenhagen and Stockholm because of that possibility, and I think that was a great opportunity also to learn our neighboring countries. Then in the 1970s, our telecommunication ministers created a Nordic mobile telephone system, which was then based of the, uh, of the GSM and all that uh, mobile telephony we have now. Uh, that was, in a way, a Nordic invention, uh, which, was built, which gave the opportunity for Nordic companies like Ericsson and Nokia to, to provide technologies both for the networks and for the consumers, and then the rest is history. We have also very strong Nordic institutions like the Nordic Investment Bank or, the, or NEFCO, its daughter organization, NEFCO, which is uh, providing finance for uh, environmental and energy projects. For example, at the moment, they are financing over 100 energy projects in Ukraine. So this Nordic cooperation is much more than just, you know, the Nordic countries. Uh, when three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, became again independent in early 90s, it was quite natural that the Nordic countries, Nordic Five, you know, wanted to do their utmost to integrate these countries into the European and global structures. We said, when we were negotiating our EU membership, we set as a goal that the European Union must have a free trade agreement below, with all of these countries, and, and that goal was achieved. Of course, we, then, we already had a free trade agreement with all these three countries before, but we also wanted the European Union to have a free trade agreement, and we really strongly supported their membership in the European Union. The integration which has taken place since that has been phenomenal. If you take our, my country, Finland, as an example, because of the 10 million people going back and forth between Helsinki and Tallinn, that has made Helsinki the busiest passenger port in Europe, overtaking Dover. Just, you know, that traffic, of course, then there are also ships going to Sweden, but the bulk of the traffic is between Helsinki and Tallinn, and as I said, more than 10 million people going back and forth every year. Very close integration, and then that continues to Latvia and Lithuania as well. Uh, many things were discussed, but I start with the hybrid and cyber. They are threats which are common to all the countries of the region, the Nordic, Baltic Eight, but also for Ireland. And these are questions and threats where border and distance don't really play a role in the way we think about traditional threats. We need more resilience, and it's very important to think these questions as well when we make our uh, governments more e-governments, because if they are not safe, if, people, if they're not perceived to be safe, it's very difficult to promote these things. Uh, 
about innovations, I was yesterday uh, in an innovation lab here in the uh, Dublin former harbor. <laughs> I, I, you know, just tell you because it was a kind of a, a nice idea. They had a company making face recognition, uh, tech, using face recognition technologies to assess the physical health of cows. Uh, you know, when they were eating, these cameras were looking at the cow and they were kind of making assessment whether this cow is feeling all right, whether he or she, whether she needs uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, medication or whatever. And I think that was uh, <laughs> quite interesting. When we are thinking about face recognitions, we think about China and, and, and uh, checking the, the people on the, on the streets, but uh, it can be do done also in the in the, uh, with, the, with the animals. Uh, when uh, Ambassador Nurk uh, talked about uh, digital services for the government, I think it's very important uh, because, you know, it can really make them uh, cheaper. And I think it's also important that, that this analog possibility is kept because we should not be pushing too much. On the other hand, those who, who, who see the advantages of uh, uh, of these modern digital services should be provided with, with them. And there are, there are quite a lot of uh, things happening also between the Nordic countries, Nordic Baltic countries, and, and especially between Finland and Estonia, as was mentioned. But I think here we all face a, a common problem, lack of skilled people. So this is quite a challenge for our education systems and our immigration systems, because without uh, foreign uh, immigrant uh, experts, I think none of our countries can really be very successful here, because I think the lack of uh, skilled people is going to be the biggest challenge in, in these questions. And I think the question of remote areas is very important. Uh, Ireland is uh, not the only country in Europe which has remote areas. I think the Nordic countries are quite long, quite large. And uh, the question of how to, how to provide for jobs and, and opportunities in the remote areas is a very actual one. Then I would like to say a few words about the Arctic region, because that's a region where the climate change is felt more acute, most acutely. Uh, this year, this summer, uh, the extent of the Arctic ice was more than 2 million square kilometers less than on average between 1980-2010. Uh, 2 million square kilometers. And there was 75% less volume in that ice cover. This is dramatic, if something is dramatic. Uh, sea absorbs 90% of the heat coming from the sun, ice reflects 90% of that heat. And everybody can understand when there's more open water, there's much more absorption of the heat, and that kind of reinforces this process. This problem of global warming will not be solved in the Arctic, but it's felt most acutely there, and I think that's important to note. And there are things happening there as well, because when there's less ice, there will be more shipping, there will be more exploration of natural resources, and, and that has to be taken into account. And for example, the thing uh, our Icelandic colleague talked about, uh, weather forecast and uh, meteorological work becomes even more important. Just imagine something would happen for a big cruise liner up in the, in the north, where the nearest helicopter is a few thousand kilometers away, and so on. I mean, these questions are becoming more acute as well. Uh, sustainability and climate are important things. Uh, Russia was mentioned here in several occasions. Uh, Russia is also our neighbor. We have 1,300 and some kilometers border with that country, so it's quite near and it's felt to a certain extent. Uh, and one of those areas where we feel that neighbor is environment. And actually, we have been quite successful in the last 15, 20 years of incorporation with the Russian cities, really to decrease the amount of uh, pollution coming from the big cities of Russia to the Baltic Sea. And actually, that has been the biggest change in the, in the, in the situation 
in the region, as most of the other countries have already taken care of that problem. So there is also a chance for a mutually beneficial uh, cooperation with Russians in these questions as well. Uh, then the last thing I would like to focus is this climate and energy discussion we just had. Uh, Finnish government, as mentioned here, has a very ambitious goal of by 2035 to be carbon neutral. When we think of carbon neutrality, there are two factors we have to take into account. First, emissions. Human activity will cause always some emissions. So in order to be carbon neutral, you must have also sinks that we, which take the carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, we are lucky in the way that we are, we are the most forested uh, developed country with 75% of the surface covered by forest. Then you have 10% lakes and not, nothing, not much more. <laughs> uh, there are some people, people living between those forests and lakes as well, 5 million of them together. Uh, but this is kind of a big plus for us because our forests are really a major carbon sink. Uh, so I think that the, the goal of being a carbon neutral 35 it can be really done, but it's going kind to of help by, by these factors. But becoming carbon neutral and, and cutting these carbon emissions really mean and require a major change in our electricity and energy systems, how we produce and consume electricity. In the case of our country, my country, 40% of, of the energy, total energy, comes from renewable sources. Uh, windmills, as mentioned here, don't need any subsidies. We can, you know, the companies are willing to invest in, in wind power without any, any subsidy element. But we have to look at other sectors as well. I think ele electricity, we are on the right track. But then we have to look heating, space heating, cooling, transport, and land use and agriculture, where we still have quite a, quite a lot of challenges. Uh, here was mentioned uh, the importance of grids, and that's really a key question. Uh, Nordic and Baltic countries, we have a common electricity market uh, and we have increasingly also capability of, of selling and buying between the countries where new power lines are being built. But here we would really need a, a much faster planning processes because there's a plan to build a power line from northern Sweden to northern Finland, mostly there are no people living there, and still the process will take seven years, which is all too long. Uh, we need much, much faster planning processes. We would like to see our neighboring country be fast as well. Uh, the last thing, which was not mentioned here, but which is important, uh, the whole concept of our economy should be around circular economy, that, that the, the concept of waste should be banned altogether, uh, you know, raw materials just circulate in the economy and the idea that something is a waste and then it's dumped in a landfill uh, should be forgotten. Uh, and I think here we have uh, quite a lot of opportunities and quite a lot of uh, expertise already in, in the Nordic Baltic region. So I think there we have a good possibilities of increasing uh, Irish, uh, Irish uh, and uh, Nordic Baltic contacts. Uh, we are facing the same challenges and uh, together we are stronger. So thank you very much for this opportunity to, to wrap up this, this very interesting and, and useful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Matti Antonin. Um, August Grumi Lamag of Galera Korja. Thank you very much for your participation, your engagement um, in today's events. I think there were some great discussions being had, even more so out of the tea and coffee. And I think you can continue those conversations now with lunch, which will be um, outside for you. The Sulung Gwanshiv on Thanavas and Law, August Sloan I hope you really enjoyed the day and safe home. Thank you very much.